Hello and welcome to DW's international reporters magazine, World Stories, with me, Leila Harak. Coming up on today's show, an up-close look at climate change in Peru. Plus, we'll take a trip down memory lane in Iraq and we get hooked up in Ukraine, where fishing on frozen lakes comes with a catch. That's all ahead. But we kick off the show in style. When the weather is cold, most of us just want to curl up at home, warped up in something warm. One high-quality fabric with a reputation for keeping you warm is is cashmere. The world's finest and silkiest cashmeres come from Mongolia. The country is home to a close-knit community of nomadic herders that tend to mountain goats, grazing at dizzying altitudes in the Gobi Valley. Our reporter from TMTV has this story on how Gobi cashmere is becoming a hot commodity in more ways than one. Mongolia is a land of extremes. The landlocked country has very little arable land. About 30% of the population is nomadic. For centuries, their livelihood has depended on breeding livestock and finding fertile pasture for their animals to graze. And Mongolian meat and wool products are developing a reputation for their high quality on the global market. Our animals aren't fenced in. They are allowed to graze freely and eat naturally grown grass. We don't give them any artificial food. That's why our Mongolian products are natural and ecological. Last year, there were around 20 million goats in Mongolia, and the numbers continue to rise. Mongolia produces 6,700 tons of raw cashmere each year, or about 30% of the world's supply. The hair is obtained from cashmere goats, who are combed once a year during the spring molting season. You have to comb the goat's hair when they shed their winter coat. Otherwise, it can't be combed out. You can do this at the beginning of March, at the very earliest. But the season varies from region to region. Sometimes it's the end of April. We always comb the animals by hand. You have to be very careful to ensure the hair doesn't break when you pull it out, to ensure good quality. The productivity of goats varies considerably. Female goats yield an average of 250 to 400 grams, whereas males can produce half a kilo or more. So these goats are more than just a family pet. Cashmere is often compared to gold because of the high price it fetches on the world market. Today, we got a good yield from combing. Almost six kilos of cashmere. When we comb the others, we'll have over 10 kilos. Actually, almost 20 kilos. We'll get almost 400,000 togrog. So we've worked well today. After the herders have gathered the hair, it's brought to the factories to be processed. First, the rough cashmere is sorted out into 20 groups, according to color and quality. Then the hair is washed and the top layer is removed. The other layers are dyed, bleached and dried. Over a thousand colors can be used to dye cashmere. In its natural state, the valuable fabric is white, beige, gray, and brown. But these colors are rarely used for the finished garments. Finally, after a thorough washing and a quick press, the finished products are ready to hit store shelves. We used to use only cashmere. Everything was 100% cashmere. But now we also use silk, leather and other materials. By combining cashmere with other materials, we've improved product quality and given our designs a modern feel.
I chose Mongolian uh, cashmere products because it's famous and I made already good uh, experience with that because I bought already two years ago for me and now I'm buying some products for my family and me. I think that the Mongolian uh, cashmere products are one of the best of the world and they are very fashionable. They have also very new style. But tourists are not the only ones who buy cashmere products made in Mongolia. Locals also like them. The growing popularity of cashmere products is helping improve the lives of Mongolia's nomads. Next, we head north to a remote Arctic outpost where an infrasound station keeps track of nuclear activity by collecting ultra-low frequency sounds and audible to human ears. Greenland is part of a worldwide monitoring system that has detectors across the globe. The listening stations can detect illicit nuclear tests and assure the international community upholds the worldwide ban on nuclear detonations. UNTV's Kirsty Hansen shows us how listening closely can keep the world safe. Kanak is Greenland's most northern town. It counts more huskies than people among its 650 residents. It's as unlikely a place as any to keep guard against atomic explosions. But at this barren outpost, a committed team uses high science to do exactly that. Kanak is located 1,100 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle. Winter temperature is about minus 20. In the winter, snow and ice and constant darkness makes it difficult to access the elements. It's autumn, but Sven Erik braves the conditions year-round to run the infrasound station. It detects atomic blasts. The station is part of the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty, or CTBTO's network of sensors that monitor the globe for violations of the agreement. Nuclear explosions produce distinctive low-frequency sound waves that can travel across continents. Arrays like these record them. The station listens for nuclear noise around the clock. Engineer Jurassi Carvalho has traveled from the CTBTO's Vienna headquarters to upgrade the station. New antenna and radios are installed that forward data in near real time to Vienna for analysis. It's very easy to check this whole system remotely from the element to see if you're sending data to the central facility. A visit like this happens roughly once every three years, so a lot gets packed in. A new computer and software is installed. An audit of equipment and spares taken. And most crucial, training. In the harsh, dark winter months to come, it's friend Eric who is on the front line to keep the station running, to catch any nuclear blasts. Next, we continue our journey in Peru, a largely desert country that is thirsty for water. Around the world, glaciers have fallen victim to global warming, and Peru has become a prime example of climate change in action. Rising temperatures in the South American country have taken their toll on the region's limited water supply. Hardest hit, the capital, Lima. Marian Hutter reports on steps being taken to alleviate Lima's shortage of water. This is a delivery of drinking water. One cubic meter costs about 10 soles, over 2 euros 70. It's not enough for four days, more like three, because in the summer you use more water. 20% of households in Lima do not have running water and have to buy what they need from the owner of the tanker that delivers it. His water costs five times as much as water from the state utility. 
So water is scarce in the poor outlying neighborhoods and very expensive. There is little evidence of poverty in the city center. And there appears to be plenty of water. Lima wastes a lot of its resources, says Christian Leon. He is an agricultural engineer and economist working on the Lima Water Project, funded by Germany's Education and Research Ministry. The idea is to develop sustainable water and wastewater management systems. Basically, Lima is a city where it never rains. It's very dry. Thanks to the many reservoirs and tunnels in the Andes, the river Rimac still provides enough water, at least for the millions of people here. Lima is growing fast. It's estimated the population may rise from 9 million to 11 million by 2020. It's the world's second biggest desert city after Cairo. But there is water in the mountains nearby because of the glaciers and because it rains here in the summer. This is a reservoir at an elevation of more than 4,000 meters. But the local people say they notice changes in the climate. Rosaria Zarata has lived here for almost 60 years. She says the peaks used to be covered in snow. It hasn't snowed here for four or five years. And the rain starts later and later each year. That's an effect we can already observe. The climate models show the rains only start in December now instead of October or November. That's a problem for managing the water in the reservoirs because they only fill later in the year, though the demand is always there in Lima. Water from the mountains is channeled into the Rimac. Water consumption in Lima averages 250 liters per person per day. But it's not all used by the individuals themselves. There are more than 120 parks in the capital, all maintained with drinkable water. In some neighborhoods, the authorities are using hardier plants that don't need so much water. But these are just pilot projects. This is another way to save water. A sewage plant filters wastewater that can then be used to irrigate parks and gardens. Christian Leon says it's a good idea, but the scale needs to be greater. If you look at the big picture and consider projections for the future, how many such small filtration plants would have to be built to cover the demand for irrigation water, it is a very inefficient solution in economic terms, in terms of energy waste and staffing. Christian Leon and his team at Lima Water say the answer lies with the state water company Serapal. It has to develop a long-term plan to deal with climate change, in cooperation with the municipal authorities in Lima. Because the municipality and Sedepal are two independent entities and do not have any direct connection to one another, they have to be brought together so they can talk. And that's what we're trying to do with our Lima Water Project. Sedapal has recently gotten involved in informing the public about water issues. Groups of school children are visiting water purification plants. The hope is that they will tell their schoolmates about what they've learned. We should save water and not waste it on things we don't really need for our lives. Pricing is another issue. Poor people without running water pay too much, while people who do get water out of the tap pay too little. But Serapal alone cannot change the rates. Another government agency is responsible for them. Of course, it would help a lot if the rates were changed, so there was an incentive for people to use less water. The difficulty in getting various agencies to cooperate makes it all the harder to tackle Lima's water problem. Yet there is a lot of water in the air. Parts of Lima are buried in thick fog much of the time. 
This fog collector on a hill outside the city has an average yield of 250 litres of water a day in winter. Christian Leon says it's an effective and cheap method and could be used much more widely. Fog clings to the hills between 400 and 800 meters above sea level. And in this area, one could build lots of collectors. There are plenty of hills available for setting up such systems. A collector costs the equivalent of 280 euros. Foreign aid organizations paid for this one. Farmers can use water gathered in the winter to irrigate their crops in the summer. Fog collectors are still a rare sight here, but that could change. The demand for water in Lima is sure to rise. Now, for the past couple of months, Iraq has seen a spike in sectarian violence. Headlines of bloodshed in the streets of Baghdad are a stark reminder of the violence tearing the country apart. But Iraq hasn't always been a place of doom and gloom, where nobody can venture out, let alone use public transportation. In its heyday, the Iraqi railway had passenger trains that boasted some of the most stylish and comfortable carriages in the region. Ishtiaq Adel from El Sumeira TV reminisces with past passengers and gives us a taste of what it was like in the golden days of rail travel. All the older people who used to take trains have fond memories of those days. Today, we're asking them exactly what they remember. Hold on tight. Have you ever traveled by train? I used to travel by train in the early 1970s. There were several stations in Baghdad back then. One in the east, one in the west, and the main station in the center. There were French-style trains with sleeping cars. They were very comfortable. They also had a restaurant car. The published departure and arrival times were reasonably reliable. But we stopped taking the train at the end of the 90s because all the lines had become too chaotic. It's such a shame. I haven't taken a train in eight years. The memories I have of train travel are so nice. We used to go from Mosul to Baghdad. I can even remember the departure times. Every two hours from 6 p.m., so 8 p.m., and then 10 p.m. The prices were very reasonable. The train stopped in several places, in Tikrit and Dejel. People would get on and others would get off. You could make new friends. I really have very good memories. The first time was in 1980. I went to Mosul with the train, a city in northern Iraq, around 350 kilometers north of Baghdad. It was a student trip. Yes, I used to travel by train to Samara in northern Iraq. We would always go by train and then walk to the next stop and then travel again by train. Life wasn't so hard back then. How old were you when you first took the train? Oh, I was still a child at school in the 70s. As far as I can remember, I was 16 or 18 at the time. 
عالمنا الخرج طبع الوفا بدرب الهوى واحنا قرزنا الستاير للشباب العبر من هالبوا من هالبوا واحنا عالمنا الخرج طبع الوفا بدرب الهوى you could have some interesting experiences on the train. You might have the number seven seat, and then suddenly an older man or woman would come along with the same number, and you'd start arguing. Both sides would insist the seat was theirs. In the end, you'd let the older person sit down. It was madness. How they gave out seats was all wrong. That's how it was. That first time I traveled by train, I was still a student. There was a group of us. We had a good time. Lots of fun. We sang and clapped while the others were sleeping. Then someone got up and asked us if we weren't ashamed of ourselves. That's how it was back then. I used to fall out of the train into my father's arms with joy, and then we continued on together to the shrine of Muhammad. Armed with a rod, reel and bait, fishing enthusiasts in Ukraine can sit for hours on a frozen lake for a chance to relax and maybe catch some fish. Ice fishing is a popular pastime in the country, but when the alcohol starts to flow, well, casting a line can sometimes be too much fun and seriously compromise personal safety. So Ukrainian authorities are now encouraging anglers to be more cautious. Yaroslav Krechko from TVI has more on this story. For Mikola, winter is all about fishing. He's been going out on the ice for 20 years now. But he doesn't bother with safety gear, even though he once fell through the ice. There was no one. My friend was by the car, so I got myself out. When the ice started breaking, I lay on my back and rolled myself up like a rug. Recently, a fisherman in the Ukrainian capital was less lucky. He was unable to climb out of his fishing hole, and he drowned. So the rescue services have decided to train fishermen how to get out of the water like seals, in case they slip in. The main thing is not to panic. The rescuers demonstrate the use of hoses and life preservers in an emergency. They can help save people up to 15 meters away. The emergency services also have a hovercraft, even though it hasn't been used for two years now. This year we managed to save three people's lives and help 12 others. The main problem was hypothermia. They want to raise awareness among fishermen at the Kiev Reservoir on the Dnieper River, making sure they know that they are responsible for their own safety. You should check how thick the ice is, and you shouldn't come to the river without any means of helping yourself. You need at least 10 meters of rope. Another problem is that there aren't enough emergency personnel for all the fishermen in Kiev. And despite the dangers and warnings, many still take unnecessary risks, which cost people their lives each year. Often, you can't get out on your own. You need someone to rescue you. Instructions don't help. The emergency services advise avoiding drinking alcohol on the ice. Alcohol, ice and water are incompatible. Hot tea, tea and tea again, with a slice of lemon if you want. But the fishermen prefer to keep warm with a stiff drink rather than with tea. We usually have a bottle of vodka, enough for three of us, 150 or 200 milliliters per person, or even 400, not bad. It's fine. The ice is good. We've got a rod and everything we need, mosquito grubs, so we're catching nice white fish. Changing habits and learning safety skills should help ensure that more Ukrainian ice fishermen enjoy their catch. 
not for the faint-hearted. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks so much for watching World Stories. We hope to see you again next time. I'll leave you now with this week's Fix of the World. Take care.